right, so tonight's business meeting, um, I'm gonna open it up. Um, I call the meeting to order. Uh, Eliza is our secretary, but she's not with us. So I'm gonna read the minutes from the 2019 meeting, which was a very short meeting. And then I'll have Chuck um, unmute and give a financial report if he's got that. Then I'll just kind of go over the old business. Uh, we'll see if there's any new business and then we'll do our elections, which should go really fast. So the 2019 meeting was on July 30th of 2019 at the um, NAFEX NNGA conference in Iowa. We opened the meeting at 5.30 that night. Um, it was called to order. And the officers there were Chuck Wilson and Eliza Green Greenman. And she was, Eliza was filling in as president at the time. Um, the biggest point of that meeting was to note that um, several board members were ending their terms and that there were two officer vacancies, one being the president uh, and um, one was a, um, uh, was one of the other offices, I can't remember which one. And then we also had the couple board members ending their terms. So Chuck had made a motion at that meeting to nominate um, me from the general membership to be on the board and then to be considered to be board president or be the president. Um, I accepted the nomination to be on the board. That motion was seconded and passed. The board um, later convened to um, elect me as president. Um, that did not happen at the general meeting, but that happened in August. So um, after that, the meeting was adjourned and those are the minutes. So. What I need uh, tonight is uh, we follow Robert's rules of order. So I need someone to unmute and um, motion that we accept the minutes and someone to second it, and then we'll take a vote. So you all can unmute yourselves. Move that we accept the minutes. All okay. right. And yeah, and that's Bill, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, when you guys motion and second, if you can give me your names, because I can't see everybody. Chuck. Do I have a second? Chuck. Chuck, all right. All right, so all those in favor of, of accepting the 2019 minutes, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Aye. <laughs> all right, motion carries. All right, Chuck, would you like to give the financial report? Hey, can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, um, we had uh, approximately, uh, and I, I don't have the exact numbers because I do year end and it's not the year end. So I, uh, the December stuff's incomplete. Okay. But the, the balance at uh, CNB was 15,000 last year, it's 19,000 this year. This is about 4,700 uh, increase, which is basically all dues. Uh, and then on farmers, we had 5,507 last year, and we got 54,55 this year. So there's about $50 discrepancy. However, I paid. I wouldn't keep in track of things the way I should have, and I paid both of the big checks out of out of the uh, FSB account, which was eight hundred four dollars. So we really had from the the account that's getting the square income and a few checks, uh, we we had uh, about eight hundred dollars income. So you add that together, we got somewhere around $5,000 of income. Now, there's also a Morgan Stanley account, which got the 37,000 now, it had about 31,000 a year ago. And I guess we can thank Mr. Trump for that. Uh, he did something good. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, we do have $399 for pre-fine as an expense. 
and I've been paying it out of my credit card. I'm going to reimburse myself before the end of the year. Uh, it's about uh, was it fourteen dollars and nineteen dollars a month. Uh, now we're not planning on uh, going to anything other than free find at present, are we? No, I, I don't think so. This is Taylor. Okay, well, I'll get that paid and get it switched to the. I, I'm going to have to run some kind of expense through the the NAFAX credit card because it's never been used. Uh, and make sure it works before I switch. Uh, and anyway, uh, the total funds available uh, then are about. Uh, just a little short of sixty thousand dollars. Okay. All right. So what we'll do is, after Chuck does the year-end financials, we'll report that in the next Pomona so that everybody has that. Does that sound good, Chuck? That'll give me a reason to get on the stick and get it done, won't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks, Chuck. All right, uh, old business. So um, since August of 2019, there were two big pieces of old business that we focused on. I mentioned this last week. One was to bring back the printed Pomona because we felt after talking to people that that was one of the reasons why we lost a lot of members um, over a period of time. I don't I personally don't remember when the printed Pomona stopped, um, but we started it back up again last year around this time. And we have seen an increase in membership of about 20% since then. So I'm taking that as a good sign. Um, and we've had, we've had about 25 to 30% of, of members requesting the printed Pomona. So we're only printing it for those that want it mailed to them which is different than how NAFEX used to do it. NAFEX and most groups used to print their quarterlies and send it to everybody, whether they wanted it by mail or not, because back in the day, you know, there was no internet. So now with the internet, we have some folks wanting it digitally only and others that want the printed version. So we're only printing it and mailing it to those requesting the printed Pomona. And so the expenses are much less than what they used to be for that. Plus we've had some people step up and make um, either donations or they have, um, uh, we've had a couple of people print, put ads in the Pomona to help cover expenses. So that's been a plus. We brought the website up to date. That was old business. That was, that was a huge issue last year. And thanks to Eric and Taylor, that is now running the way it should be and um, being kept up to date. So unless I'm missing anything, does anyone have any old business that I am not covering? Okay, we'll move on to new business, um, which some of it's old, but kind of new. We've never really worked too much on it. So new business, um, one of the things that we've talked about as a board that we feel we need to do is bring to increase our outreach and diversity and our membership. Um, we have not had a membership chairperson uh, since I've come on the board. And I don't know who that person was prior to us, but I've been covering membership along with Chuck. Um, tonight we will vote for a membership, a membership chair. And I know several people have stepped up to uh, that. So that's a good sign. Um, we've had some discussions about assessing our interest group lists and I've had some emails from people who are wanting to help with that. And then in preparation for this meeting, I reviewed our bylaws and um, I've noticed some things that are out, to, out of date or need to be fixed. Um, mainly there are committees listed for which I don't think we've had for quite a while. Um, so the new board, once we have the new board members joining us, the new board will convene early next year to kind of go through the bylaws and figure out what we need to amend um, or if we need to bring back some committees or try to bring back some committees that are there. Um, there's a program committee chair, which we don't have 
program committee. Chair is responsible for organizing the annual meeting. Um, and then the membership chair is not even listed in the board, the bylaws, as far as I can see it at glance. So we need to add that in there. So there's just some little tweaks that need to happen, but that's the new business that um, I think we need to address. Does anybody have any comments about any of these three items? I don't know if Barbara's on the call, but she's the one most familiar with the bylaws. I think she was the one who helped amend them the last time. And I don't know if uh, Taylor- Bill, Bill Grimes and Barbara Russell did that together. Okay. All right. And so that most recent revision was in 2017. It was printed in the spring Pomona. And if it's not, if the bylaws are not on the website, then I will, work with Eric and Taylor to get those up on the website so that they're, they can be viewed by all members. Yeah, they, I have not seen them on the website. This is Barbara Russell, uh, but I have seen them in the Pomona. And if you're a member, you can search the old Pomonas to the 2017 April or spring Pomona rather, and, and you'll see them uh, at the end of that Pomona. Okay, thank you. All right, and then the other new business, which we really can't do anything about until we know more about COVID is the 2021 conference. Um, because the 2020 conference was, in-person conference was canceled, we were supposed to do that with the California Rare Fruit Growers Association in August of this past year. The board voted and agreed to just postpone that and do that conference with the California Rare Fruit Growers next year um, assuming that we can meet in person. But until we know how the vaccine's gonna go and how travel is gonna go, um, we probably can't really do much about that until we know more. Bill, do you have any any thoughts on what's going on with that? Uh, no, I've heard no updates. As far as I know, it's still, still scheduled, but you know, here again, it's depending. Right, and I assume still in Santa Rosa? Yes, ma'am. Okay, all right. So as we know more, then the board will address this. What is the date of that pending scheduled um, meeting? This is Adam speaking. Uh, that would be August. I'm not sure the exact date. It's probably about the 14th, what are the middle of the month, whatever that is. Yeah, last year was, I think, around the 12th, 13th, 14th or something around there. Um, as soon as I know more, I will pass that on to the membership so that everybody has that. All right, so th is there any other new business, anything that anyone would like to bring up that we should be thinking about or addressing? I uh, just checked the website. We do have 699 current members. I don't know if that was mentioned earlier, but. So that's actually users. Um, so if I understand the website correctly, the, that's the number of people who've been in the system since you guys created that new website. Not all of that 699 are members. Um, the, toll, the, the number that I pulled off for emailing was 375 to today. Gotcha, sounds like you know more about than I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have Eric and, I, Eric and I and you can look at that and, and double check to make sure. Um, but there's a user section and there's a member members number and they're, they're two widely different things. And I think, I think that 699 is the number of people who have been in there, um, have been a member since the new website came out, but they're not all current members at the moment. So, but we'll check that and verify that. Gotcha. Anything else? All right, so elections. Um, Barbara had put together a wonderful printed up uh, nominating committee report. Uh, she and Bill worked on this and I think Chuck may have had uh, some input perhaps, um, but we need to replay, we have four board members moving off the board and thankfully they found four um, great people who are wanting to be on the board, willing to serve. 
the four here, we had them talk last week and introduce themselves. Um, I believe they are all on the call this evening. Um, and we aimed to try and find people that covered as much of North America as possible from different areas. And I think this is really good that we've got people from, from uh, different parts of the country. Um, I think we had hoped to get somebody from Canada, but we haven't been able to get somebody with that, but we could still add somebody. Um, since we, unless somebody disagrees with me, and it's been a while since I've read all of Robert's rules of order, but um, since we're replacing four and we have four wanting to um, be nominated, or four who have been nominated, I think we can do this in all one big uh, motion and um, vote. So we don't have to vote on them individually. So I, what I would like is somebody who can make a motion to accept all four nominees and someone who would second it and then we can take the vote. But if there's um, any discussion or anyone from the membership here on the call that wants to be considered, feel free to please comment before we have a motion. I move that we accept all of them. I second that. Is that Tom? Yes. Okay. Is there any discussion? Do anything we need to discuss? All right. You guys I want to make sure that I, this is Barb. I want to make sure. Well, Barb, we went, lost you. I wanted to make sure that Jorge's uh, name was spelled correctly for to his satisfaction. Uh, did you work that out with him? I got an email from him, but I have not double checked the spelling. So we'll. Uh, is he on? Jorge, are you on the call? Yes, I'm on the call. Thank you so much. Okay, is it J O R G E J dot Zaldivar Z A L D I V A R? Correct. I just sent a message to to Chris over the chat, and it, it all looks good. But since this is for a motion. Um, it might be good for the secretary to have it um, written. Yeah, the the uh, it should be that the the the, the thing that I wrote has that in that way. So you should you should be good. Okay. Yeah, I'll make sure that it's all correct in the minutes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Barb. All oh, right. So we have a motion. I'm sending you the email of what you asked for so you can follow along on the presentation. Uh, I, yeah, I cannot access that email at the moment. Oh, oh, I know you're saying, Hoya, you're saying that you sent an email to Barb? Correct. Okay, good. All right. All right, so we have a motion to accept all four nominees and someone who seconds it. Um, you all can unmute. Everyone who is in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. aye. Is there anyone who opposes? All right, motion carries. All right, the last part of the elections, uh, the nominating committee, board of directors, for Board of Directors, um, Barbara has um, stepped up to uh, be nominated for the vacant membership chair. Is there any other nominations from the floor for this? All right. So no further nominations. I'll need someone who will move to accept Barbara. I ex accept or I move that Barbie membership chair. Taylor. Anybody second? This is Bill, I second. All right. Everyone can all unmute. Those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? 
All right, motion carries. Can we have a round of applause for our new board members and uh, those serving still? <laughs> All right, thank you guys. So for the new board, for the, the board, the new board now, um, after the holidays, I will email out and we'll arrange a Zoom call so we can just uh, touch base and uh, start working on some new business and um, getting to know each other. So um, those who have served, I wanna thank, I know Bill's on the call. Thank you, Bill. We appreciate all You're of welcome. your work. Um, I don't know if there's anybody else going off who's on the call, but- um, Bar Barbara. Well, Barbara, but she's staying on because she's member. Well, she's <laughs> uh, kind of. Not a really a board member anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I have a I have a question. Um, we need to keep in front of us that that program manager needs to be filled. Yes. And um, for next year, and so as long as long as the membership's here, please, we need a program manager for the for next year's meeting. Um, Please, somebody uh, volunteer. It'd probably be good if you were out in the West. Yeah. So how that will work is the program chair will work with the California Rare Fruit Growers. Um, and, you know, part of it is, is helping find speakers and um, working with the California Rare Fruit Growers to help organize a meeting and whatever NAFEX can do to help them during the meeting. If for some reason... Uh, we can't have the in-person meeting because of COVID, then we would likely re uh, consider again another online conference. Um, and so that program chair would help work and help organize that. Um, and of course, uh, the board can help as needed and other members can help as well. All right. Chris, I'd so. be willing to take that on. I have a background in event coordination. And oh, Leslie, wonderful. <laughs> but I'd love to put together a committee um, okay. yes. with me on that, of course, because okay. you all have more experience having never attended one of the events. Uh -huh. um, it would be helpful to have a good committee with, with great perspective and experience. Okay, fantastic. And for speaker selection too. Yes, all right. All right, so thank you guys for the, getting us through the elections. I think that is the last piece of business that I have. Is there anything that I've missed? Anything? Chris, we'll do the election of officers at the next meeting, uh, the first meeting of the year. Is that how you do it? Yes. Yeah, so we elected officers basically last August. So technically August of 2019. So 2021 is officer elections again. Just one request, if you wouldn't mind uh, after the holidays when you um, start thinking about getting us together. If you wouldn't mind sending the bylaws around, I'd love to get familiar okay. with them. That'd be great. Yeah, I will definitely do that. Thank you. All right. All right. So do I have someone who will make a motion to adjourn the meeting? I'll move. This is Leslie. All right. Leslie, okay. the primary motion. Second. Anyone second it? This is Tom. I second, I'll second Barbara. It. I'll all right, I have Barb seconding the motion. All right, all those in favor of the motion passing? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, motion adjourned. Or motion, meeting adjourned, not motion. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long, long week. All right, so with that, I'm gonna get out of my screen share. All right, and then um, we have Jorge who's speaking tonight. Um, he is from Florida. Um, just a little quick biography. He's a tropical fruit farmer in, I'm gonna really mess this up, Guavonia Guava Grove, say that three times real fast, in Homestead's Redland. He collects rare fruit and studies the agricultural history of the Miami Redland area. Um, he's got several, especially crops, um, one of which includes the mango, and that's what he's going to be talking about tonight. His family's from Cuba's Orient province in the Caribbean. 
Uh, he supports a lot of various um, clubs and horticulture societies in his hometown. Uh, he's been involved in the Tropical Fruit and Vegetable Society of Redland um, and their sister club of Redland Fruit and Spice Park, where he's a volunteer. Um, the Rare Fruit Council International is headquartered in Miami, Florida, and he serves on the board of the South Florida Palm Society as president and um, the Miami Pioneers and Natives of Dade a Historical Society. He's also a goodwill ambassador for the Edible South Florida Magazine, um, part of the Edibles Community Network of Publications, which I think many of you are familiar with. All right, he is currently drafting an article for the Histor History, My for History Miami Museum's um, journal called Tequesta. So he is speaking tonight and Jorge, I will let you go ahead and take over screen share when you're ready. Thank you, I'm here. Jorge, I can hear you. There we go. <clears throat> okay, thank you so much. I'm you know, happy to present this to an audience outside of, of Florida, which is usually where, where I'm giving this, you know, this, this interesting information. <clears throat> but it's deserving of, of being compared to some of the work that you all do with the search for cultivars and the perfection of methods. And I was greatly assisted by Alex Salazar, who is an expert, much like a lot of us here that dedicate a lot of time to just, you know, odds and ends of the topics that people overlook. And he's a, he's a great asset for helping identify things. And you'll see how the story kind of starts winding in a circle and This is a selection of mangoes that we were able to harvest at the USDA um, ARS. So I know you all are familiar with the stations around the country, and we're lucky to have uh, the station that has the more uh, tropical crops and the specialty crops that are a backbone of our industry here of agriculture. The Anacardiaceae family is the same family as poison ivy and the species is indica that we're focusing on of the mangifera genus and like all botany um it just goes more and more with all the wild species and the stories that we start finding out so you'll be seeing a lot of history some of it i'll, I'll go through rather quick because a lot of it is very uh, romantic for the area but for, for you, I definitely want to give a grasp of, of the, greater, the greater project going on. There's a gentleman by the name of Henry Perrine. Dr. Perrine was notably doing phenomenal work in the mid 1800s. And he, he really beat everyone in terms of introducing a lot of these tropical fruits such as the, the key lime, and the mango. <clears throat> and there's just a famous story of him how the, the Indians weren't happy with what he was doing in the Florida Keys. And the Florida Keys is the southernmost um, islands of the country. And they're just below Florida. And some of you might be familiar with them. And he established a little grove on one of those islands. And unfortunately, he was massacred. And out went his collection and out went the some of them some of the first explorations of fruit to bring things into florida um the indians were very keen on killing all of his trees as well that's how much they they didn't like what he was doing <clears throat> so be between that time and the late 1800s we see that there's an increase in people seeking out mango seeds this wasn't this wasn't focused on 
on grafted plants yet. And everyone was seeking any material that they can get their hands on. And just for the record there, I, I live in Miami, which is South Florida, all the way down at the South. And our incorporation as a city is 1886. So although we do have pioneers in the area, uh, North Florida, which is the, the conundrum is that all this action was happening in the North of Florida that would suffer greater freezes than the South. So the seeds are, are slowly making their way South. That's kind of the, the story that we're tracking here. And these are just some lists to just go over the sort of work that was being done um, with the cultivars people comparing the flavors and the sizes and the colors and it'll just show you how some of these cultivars were being explored and it shows you where some of them were coming from uh, notably some of them were coming from Cuba and the Cubans had gotten them from other places so a lot of exploration um, and cooperation but what we do see is this fascination the, that keeps driving it um, much like I could see the apples. Uh, this is very much like the obsession that you find with the apples. Um, the mangoes are just innumerable and you can see how uh, different cultures like the ones that come from their area. And here we see some of the known traditions such as the number 11, which is a very elusive, small. Um, and a lot of these parents were, were not optimal at, at their first arrival. It's what the breeding and the cultivation is, is for. And more lists at this stage of uh, 1887 shows you how well documented this is. Um, and all of these notable papers, I'm not, we're not gonna just read them all together. I just encourage you all to go to them on your own and pick out the things that you wanna see, but, um, the more you study the story, the more that you see that um, the years and sometimes the people, they kind of bend a little, little bit. And since you all aren't from Florida, for the most part, I feel a little more comfortable not focusing so much on the exact location of things, but more of the overall um, project that was occurring. Um, all the people working together. Um, all of these years and plants, you'll see them at a, in another slide where we can just go through them. But here you'll see some of the more notable growers in Florida's history, like uh, Plenty Reasoner, who have the Reasoner nurseries. They're legendary in introducing uh, in a surmountable number of crops through their nursery catalog. And that's where a lot of this um, historical research goes through. You try to find who introduced what, when did they bring it in, And here they are, like we mentioned, Dr. Perrine. And then we have a few people in the mid 1800s sourcing seeds from Cuba, Jamaica, um, notably the 1868 Barnes and Faulkner is probably about five miles from where I'm sitting today. And that's the Snapper Creek Canal. And then you have a few other of these notable old trees that they're the pretty much the, the grandparents. This is something I added today. And this is a, a recent find because I, I don't have an easy way of getting into the USDA library. And now much more than ever, it's become much more difficult to, you know, to visit these sorts of archives This document is important because it's written by Webster. And Wester, Wester is important because he worked over here and down in Miami with um, Simmons. And you'll hear a little bit about Simmons later. Simmons was uh, Dr. Fairchild's go-to guy. Uh, he has an avocado named after himself, the Simmons and a mango, the Edward. And it just shows you how the, the cult Tavar start revealing the story of who was doing what. Um, 
essentially, I'm honored to be doing pretty much similar work um, as Wester right now. He's just documenting things how he saw it in 1917. And now I'm tasked with trying to put all that together and see, you know, what sort of communication they had that was successful. And this is actually a photo taken by Dr. Fairchild, presumably of one of the original mango trees that Gail had over in, um, in the center of Florida. And this is supposedly one of the first parents of pretty much all the mangoes that originated from that string. And this goes pretty much, it goes down to the, the famous Hayden and we'll see how that occurs. This is the tree that I mentioned that is down the road from here. And this tree is no longer there. I think it died in 1992, the famous Hurricane Andrew. And that's another problem that um, I fail to mention it sometimes, but these hurricanes just change history uh, like nothing else. You know, 100 year old trees will just disappear because of one hurricane and it really affects the, the story because this tree has no reason to have disappeared. It was there until, you know, 25, 30 years ago. <clears throat> so here's Mrs. Hayden. This is a photo that appears in, in Dr. Fairchild's book. So I immediately took to understanding that this was an important character. And she really didn't have much to do with the, the beginning end of the process because it was her husband that was going to West Palm Beach and and getting the seeds and the plants from Gale. But nonetheless, when, when her husband died, this is the tree that they name after his surname, Hayden. And this is the first red blushed mango. This is a tree about maybe eight, eight miles down the road from where I'm at now. And this tree is luckily still there. I'm able to go visit this tree. And this is important because it shows how that passion that these people had at that moment for a tree that was no more than 20 years old, we still have the, the same passion now. So these are fruits of the Hayden cultivar that we picked off of my family's tree. It's probably 60, 70 years old. And Hayden is presumed to be a a cross between the Mogoba and the turpentine, which was the, the plentiful um, pollinating parent here in Florida. And this is phenomenal. This is the first photo that I've, I've encountered of Captain Hayden himself. I'm almost shocked to reveal it. And this was found two weeks ago in the Fairchild Archive. So it just shows more going into arts and finding things that maybe people look because their research doesn't, um, you know, doesn't focus on that particular ephemeral. Uh, I've taken to the Hayden story uh, quite a bit. So I focus on it a bit more while, you know, other people will focus on cultivars that are from their country. You know, the Jamaicans stand by their cultivars, uh, the Julie and the East Indian and that's what's so important about the mango, that it's truly the most universally accepted fruit, particularly because of the effect that it also had on the northern market where, um, you know, Dr. Fairchild's dream was to, to get the fruit out into the northern market, aside from making it a success here in Florida. And this is another phenomenal find that, that has not been seen in who knows how many years, probably since the photo was taken and put in the in the envelope. This is Dr. Fairchild and Mrs. herself um, standing under a tree that is around the corner from the original Hayden. And this is another potential discovery of a tree that we know is in that neighborhood. But the problem with that neighborhood is that it became very wealthy and you can't walk through the yards anymore. Everyone has a fence. So 
it's hard knocking on people's doors and telling them, Hey, you have a, you have a hundred something year old mango tree in your yard. It's, it's important. Let's, you know, let's take a look at it. It's, it's a little delicate to do those sorts of things, but we do it. So Dr. Fairchild is uh, insurmountably important. Um, particularly, he advocated the creation of Chapman Field. Chapman Field's important because the original introduction garden was the hot spot for where these mangoes and the avocados um, were being grafted and cultivated. And it's said that he changed the American plate more than any other individual in modern history. His introductions of soybean and broccoli and his passion for tropical fruit was just over the top. And he married Alexander Graham Bell's daughter. And the story just keeps going on and on. And he himself is a separate talk, but we can't fail to mention the, the vision. And he helped all the cadre that he had under him uh, successfully tackle the avocado, the mango. Here he's, here he's holding the Garcinia mangostana, the mangosteen, um, his favorite fruit. And, you know, we're still trying to grow this fruit. Some have successfully cultivated it in Florida, but he saw this, you know, a hundred years ago. And this is, this is just amazing. Here's a, just a varied selection of the cultivars in the years that they were either introduced into the, into the mango form or into the mango world by, you know, by people that did it. Usually the reason I say the people that did it is because because the mangoes get named after their family name. And it's kind, kind of notable. Some, some of the more esoteric varieties come from other countries. And our Florida mango growers, some of the notable names. Um, that Edward Simmons is uh, Dr. Fairchild's right-hand man. George Sellon, we'll get into him. Uh, the Zill family, the last one there is... Uh, notably still in business. They're still doing um, a big operation. The David Sturk, that's where Alex Salazar works. Uh, it's Sturk Groves, but it's Tropical Acres Farms. And that's still a property that is vintage and some of the original trees are at that property. And this is just a highlight um, slide especially here in, in Miami and here in Florida, these, these slides, there's people usually from the area of where this is occurring. So it really ignites some conversation. Um, a notable early mango grower, this is one of the earliest mango growers in, in the Miami area. We're gonna skip over him just a bit quickly. And as these slides are passed, people that get the video can, can pause and look at it or seek out the original info, but this is just a story about um, Mabel Dorn, who was imminently close to um, Dr. Fairchild. She was an advocate of the Victory Gardens, and she promoted the vegetables and all of crazy tropical crops, but they were mango farmers, and they lost their, their home to a highway. And this is just some coverage from the newspaper that I got about them, but this is the highway going through what would be their old mango grove. So we essentially lost our first commercial mango grove in the sixties. So just, you know, that's the perspective I take. And here it is, um, she's pretty much talking about some of the first trees that she got from Simmons. The, the name is misspelled, um, journalistic error there, but just shows you how there was just no one in Miami to talk to about mangoes. So these people had no other choice but to work together. Edward Simmons is here working at, um, the previous garden was in Brickell, here's at Chapman Field. So this is just going into detail about how he's working with Dr. Fairchild, um, you'll even see there's a mention of Dr. or Mr. Wilson Pope, an um, imminently important um, explorer of the times. Wilson Pope is arguably one of the, the legends out there. But here, coming back to Miami, which is 
my hometown um, comes this guy George Selim, and George Selim hit he hit the he hit the airwaves with like a number one hit. That's the best way to compare it. And Doctor Fairchild goes down in in history saying um, that he was the first person to patch bud the avocado. And through mastering the avocado, he also mastered the mango. And they were doing an insurmountable amount of of quantity of of nursery crops at an early um, haste uh, stage, probably pretty much at 1900, they were taking orders of hundreds of plants, sending them to Cuba, the Caribbean islands. Um, and Salon had pretty much 40 years to create a, um, a nursery. And like I said, he's the first person to patch bud the avocado. So. His crops were loquat, uh, avocado, and mango. This is the, the mogoba. The mogoba is the famous mango that that Hayden went over to, to get from Gale. And here, um, Celan notably created a grove of these trees, and he budded them all. And the success was budding. It seemed to have a, a much, um, much more efficient approach than grafting because you could use the material um, much more. And this is the operation. Um, these are all wooden nursery boxes, a phenomenal operation with a shade house, um, essentially slatted wood, so it wasn't nursery cloth. So essentially, this would be an equivalent of maybe 50 or 70% shade, uh, quite ingenious approach. And this is actually the last remaining tree on Ceylon's property. And if you see here, there's uh, one lone remaining, a few mangoes here, and I managed to get one on the ground, but this was last year. So this is the, the last tree. Um, the property is a church, luckily the priest, um, that has been there for maybe 30 some 40 years he recalls you know his first dates on the property that it was it had a, a lot more mango trees and this is presumably a, a mogoba and this is the the fruit from Ceylon's own tree so it was quite a you know mini adventure to be able to retrace these stories and go see one of his original trees that's the home it's still standing it's it's one of, um, at the present, the oldest concrete structure, or one of the oldest concrete structures in the city. Here it stands. I believe, um, I believe it's an office, or it served as a rectory for the for the priests. It's very important that we trace the story really quick. That we we make the connection between Fairchild and Celan. And. First, Dr. Fairchild, um, he praises um, Celan for his, you know, for his talent budding and grafting plants. And I believe the trap is a cultivar that originates here in Coconut Grove. So they were seeking material from their local area. But here's a story that's very important. It's quite funny. Uh, there's a famous mango that Fairchild uh, collected with his, one of his main benefactors was Barbara Lathrop, paid for a lot of his voyages around the world. Um, you know, Fairchild notably went, he took trips around the world uh, prior to the invention of the airplane. So, you know, he needed some, some help getting these trips coordinated. And they brought back this mango that they named the Lathrop. And funny enough, either there was an error where they, they selected did budwood from the rocky, but um, Celan got into this, and he ended up putting on a grove of Lathrop because Doctor Fairchild recommended this mango. You know, it was named after Lathrop. The flop. It was horrendous that Celan, with hair on his heels, Doctor Fairchild. So, you know, so your Dr. Fairchild sent me a lathrop. 
you know, he pretty much told them it was horrible and that he took out all of it. And it's quite funny that, you know, even, even Dr. Fairchild, the famed fruit explorer, you know, brought back something that wasn't necessarily the best. No. Came angle. And it's not a bad story, but it's, it's a little funny. Okay, is it up? Yes, yep. Okay, we're here at George Salon. How's that there? Yep, that's great. Okay, so we were at George Salon, how uh, Dr. Fairchild is, you know, Dr. Fairchild praised him at the end of his life and they went through all that, but he, he managed a great operation. There's probably a model operation for, for other nurserymen in the area. And here you have a selection of what he was doing. Um, he would produce a catalog every so many years. And this is mainly a mail order catalog. He was really trying to sell plants everywhere. This is what it would look like. Pretty interesting method of shipping. And here we go on to a little bit of more modern times. We'll just go through this quick. Well, um, Bill Whitman is one of the founders of this organization, the River Fruit Council. And his wife, for instance, got a mango named after her. And those cultivars go through the hands of, you know, many people to decide how it gets named. And the, the whole process is very involved. It just shows a lot of community. Um, he devoted a lot of time to collecting tropical fruits. This is a greenhouse where he's growing. Um, well, they're growing at Fairchild Garden, the mangosteen, and they're growing other tropicals in there. Um, the Botanic Garden notably has a germplasm at that farm. Uh, the Williams Grove, they maintain a, a large germplasm of hundreds of cultivars. This is another person um, from the organization, a more modern um, explorer. And he's introduced um, notably some of the top cultivars have gone through uh, Maurice's hands. And he notably went to Burma and brought in a, an extraordinary amount of material from Burma. And I'm able to I'm able to chat with Maurice. I just visited him, and I actually bought a, a pair of pruners from him, another pair. And he's very knowledgeable. We have the Zill family; they're doing a phenomenal amount of work. Their story is that they planted about ten thousand seedlings, and they did a selection from those ten thousand, and they started creating their you know, their own cultivars such as cocoa, coconut cream, buttercream, sugar loaf, and you'll see the, their nursery number, the row and the number perhaps. And it's notable to go back to Maurice really quick and, and notice something. What occurs here is uh, the popu kale, the PPK as we call it, um, Zill Nursery essentially named it Lemon Marine. The marketability shot up. And I'm, I'm going to gripe with this. I'm not, I'm not for changing the cult of our name, even if we can't pronounce it. Um, whether it hurts the research that I'm doing or someone down the road is going to have to crack their head to figure out when and how it happened. But, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not game with that always. Uh, Dr. Richard Campbell is another notable grower of the area. His father um, was another legendary um, University of Florida employee down here. And they started a home orchard that they call Mangleman Homestead. 
and they put out some beautiful fruit and the stuff that comes out of their their orchard is just uh, amazing top quality and here's that angie that's named after angela whitman um the fairchild mango so you know these characters they they kind of live through the cultivar here's a a cross that they did a mango for a cross so this is a, a hybrid and it's the rubropetala um, hybrid cross. And this is just um, some added ephemera here. This is a, a botanical illustrator. He's a local illustrator. Um, he's originally from Cuba, but he, he puts out some phenomenal work. And Julio Figueroa, um, this is just some phenomenal stuff that he does, not just with the mangoes, but he was really at the right place at the right time. And he'll do the cultivars, he'll do the different species. And um, these are great. They really show you the flower formation, how they differ. And a lot of them, you, you feel like you're standing in front of a tree or in front of a picture. Um, not just with that, he does the orchids and the butterflies and everything very well. And thank you for, for listening to the mango madness that uh, we have going on down here in, in Florida. I'm happy to go back to something. If you want to, you know, go back to something specific, I'm more than able to, um, to focus on something that anyone might have a question on. I know I went through some of the things uh, rather quick, but I didn't want to bore you so much with like the locations of all the places in Florida. Um, I really wanted to get you, um, like I say, that, that colorful story is kind of my, my goal. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right, so if anyone has any questions, you can unmute and ask, or maybe put it in the chat and I can ask on your behalf, doesn't matter. Um, yeah, however, however it's more comfortable for people to do, you know, whatever it is that they're interested in knowing. So I'll start off with a couple of questions. So, um, how many years, uh, if you plant a, a seed and you get a seedling, how many years until you bear fruit? Okay. So the seedlings can vary. Um, I can't tell you an exact number, but you could look at maybe seven years. It could take a little longer, um, depending on how favorable the, you know, all those perfect conditions are of, you know, cause you're growing it in a pot. And, you know, everyone wants to grow a mango in a pot, particularly people in, in the north, which is great. But if you're going to grow it in a pot to fruit it, it, it will mess with that perfect cycle if you're looking to, to try to get a, a seedling to fruit. Um, the reason that it's tough to do that is because of the water, where, you know, generally you're keeping the plant uh, alive with the water the mango likes a little bit of a dry. So generally it's harder to give it that, that natural um, cycle when it's in a pot. So it's, you know, it's a little discouraging on occasion to try to grow mangoes in pots. I'm not trying to answer your question in a different way, but you got to start somewhere. So a lot of the cultivars do come from um, seedlings. Uh-huh. Yes, yeah, so I guess that brings me to my next question. When you talked about Zill's work and all the seedlings that they had and selected for, did they graft and then select or did they wait for the seedlings to bear fruit themselves? Well, when you, when you go around and, and listen to these topics more and more, you, you listen to what people say and they were actually looking for um, indications that it was gonna be a superior fruit without the fruit. And that's interesting. So they were actually smelling the leaves. Ah. But wow. that's just one aspect of culture. Uh -huh. um, they do wait for it to fruit because then the whole thing is, as you can tell, the names are, they're all, you know, berry and fruit and coconut, you know. So there's a, there's a big picture of, they're trying to, they're trying to unload it the full way, you know. They're trying to give you a, a, a good cultivar that can also be disease resistant. Um, 
that's good fruit. And then you also start finding fruit that's earlier, that's a little later. So I'm luckily not in, not in the, <laughs> not in the business of that type of work, but it really, it really incorporates a lot of, um, of comparative data to other things that exist. So you could say, wow, this is better than that one. And this is better than the other one. And then, you know, people start ranking their top 10, their top five. Um, but it gets to a point that with hundreds and hundreds of these cultivars, you start realizing that sometimes it's better to have a favorite early mango and then a favorite late mango. And um, there's just a lot of genetic diversity. And just to round off that question, um, the USDA is working with the, the SMP, which is the DNA uh, data and they're actually discovering that cultivars in different germplasm are differing with the DNA match so it's a little bit of a cultivar drift within yeah it's pretty interesting so great so we have a question in the chat um what's the farthest Uh, we, we can't hear Chris, or at least I can't. I heard something, uh, what is the farthest, maybe north? That's a good question. Okay, I see. What is the farthest north that people have successfully fruited mangoes? Um, I know I see these these uh, I see this type of um, this type of info comes um, sometimes you see it on like on forums. I'm not exactly sure of the location, but the unfortunate part of of people that have fruited it in those northern locations is that eventually the tree will will suffer. The good thing about that is that um, on a lot of occasions the trees will come back. Can you see the, the chat box, Jorge? Yes, I do. I see it. Okay. I think someone had a question. Do you know if mangoes can be grown in a greenhouse? Did you? Yeah, you could. You could grow in a greenhouse. Um, kind of goes into that. Into that situation I explained prior. Even if it's in the greenhouse, protected from the cold, you're still. Um, you're still growing it in a, in a pot. And this topic comes up on occasion. You have some really good advice of people that are telling other people to do it and to try it, but there's some good information that comes from people that are, you know, we're not discouraging people to try to do it in a pot, um, but it's just a little difficult. Um, it definitely can be done, but the mango is just one of those trees that really wants to set the roots and, and do its thing. You know, and the cold, the cold brings in the blooms and, and I'm not, I'm not like a strict greenhouse grower because I'm luckily I'm, I'm down here in South Florida. So I see that, um, Lowe's for quality fruit and plant health. I, I can reference all this sort of material from charts and things that I have. I have a lot of data available. So, you know, through my research, you kind of see I, I can put, um, you know, numbers to things a little better when I have the data in front of me. I don't want to be giving you just um, numbers. And again, luckily, since I am in um, South Florida, I just don't have to deal with um, knowledge of how low will it go. I'm, I'm a bit lucky. Um, 
but I definitely can send over that info on some, you know, some good mango stuff. Someone asked something about how north in, in Florida, and I, I just mentioned just in case someone didn't hear, some of those trees, sometimes they perish and sometimes they will come back. And you also have to watch out some of those trees, if they are grafted, um, they'll come back from the rootstock. Hey, Chris. Is anyone, you, is anyone here growing mango? Chris, you're That's muted. A, I saw you talking, I think. I'm hey. not growing mango. <laughs> cool. So I don't know. If I, I got lost on one of my computers um, and I'm back on. I don't know if this was answered, but Chris asked what uh, are typical minimum lows for quality fruit and plant health? Yeah, I can I can send some some info about the healthy range um, of what the tree likes. Um, I guess it kind of shows you where I'm focusing my my research. I'm a lot more interested in the in the research of things than the than that's that overall culture because I am in an area where you know we we planted and the mango. Will, will definitely not die from a freeze down here in, in Miami because we barely get them. But, but yeah, I have, I have info on that. Okay. And more and more you have a lot of these um, people, whether they're knowledgeable or new, new to growing, you know, everyone wants to plant a mango. So I think now more than ever, we're going to find out because of the internet and they can show you a photo of their dead tree immediately when it happens. Um, <laughs> More and more and more, we're going to see people after this winter, we'll see whose trees made it, how far north. But, um, you know, in these plant groups, you see as soon as the, the cold starts coming, people are posting photos of the mattresses and how they're covering their plants, um, Christmas lights wrapped around the trunk. People make um, enclosures with heaters, with extension cords coming out of their house. So that's mango for you. Like people are trying to do it as far north as it can happen. I know people in Alabama. I know people in the Virginia area growing them. Um, so you do have some of this area um, on the East Coast. New Orleans, for instance, uh, they're doing it, Louisiana. So there's people brave out there. I was going to say, I know there's somebody here in Indiana who is I think growing in a greenhouse. Um, he, he grows a lot of tropi tropical fruit, including bananas. Um, and that somebody, Chris also asked, uh, any hardy relatives that we Northern folks should look into as minimally heated greenhouse crops? Yeah, I think the not necessarily um, hardy relatives. They mean relatives in, in, in that genera or um, I think the Mertesi family has some, some interesting genera uh, like Eugenia. The Eugenia genus is, is excellent for, for greenhouse. Um, they've got a, a variety of fruits in there, a lot of little berry type stuff. Um, this is the guava genus. That's why I'm mentioning it, um, or the guava family. Um, but as far as minimally heated, that makes it a little difficult because it's hard to gauge what will happen. But, um, you know, I think, um, you know, we love the plants enough that once you get it, you're going to do as much as you can to protect it. So... Maybe I can encourage you to get a little bit more zone bending, but um, yeah, I, I would also encourage you um, for pot culture, you could look into um, into some of the Anonaceae, um, specifically the um, the Anona squamosa, the sugar apple. 
Um, these are delicate plants, but the reason I'm recommending them is because if you do take care of them, you can fruit them in a container. That would be more of what I would, what I would try to recommend for you to grow, something you can actually fruit in a container. Um, the mango is more of an obstacle. So um, between the Anonesi and the Mertesi, um, guava, for instance, would be uh, another choice. I would highly recommend guava. They can take the temperature well, and you can fruit in a pot. And if you're into that flavor, you look into the genus, the uh, Cidium, and there's a bunch of other species in that genus. If you Maybe you end up liking uh, the leaves, you end up liking how they grow, and you, know, you start surfing that genus, and you start finding a bunch of these other species that are, you know, that you might like either the plant, you might like the fruit, but these are deserving of pot culture, definitely. And if you want to get crazy, um, you can do some, some Garcinia as well, just because they're really pretty plants, but they're delicate. Great. Are there any other questions for Jorge? I see here, Chris wrote about a uh, yes to Eugenia. So, uh, I see, you know, he sees the direction I'm pushing, so good. And the Sizigium, that would be great because um, the flower is notably one of the most um, beautiful flowers. So um, the Sizigium genus there is very cool. It's, you know, for people in your areas, you'll be one of the few people growing that. So, you know, striking plants and, very hardy, you know. All right. Um, thank you again, Jorge. And somebody brought up a question about seeing the presentation. So the link that I put up for last week's, apparently um, it's requesting my username and passphrase. So I need to redo that. So give me a day or two to... Um, get a public link from IU. I thought it, I thought what I put up was public, but apparently not. So I will get that fixed. And then I'll also um, get this one um, up as well in a couple of days. Um, lots of people love the talk. And um, at this point, if you guys have anything you want to ask in general to each other or any comments, go ahead and unmute or ask or put it in the chat. Um, but this is a time for you guys to chat with each other and ask any questions or throw anything out there that you'd like. Um, I have one question about the presentation. I, I uh, was following along with the, uh, down with the uh, information that Z Z Mr. Zaldivar sent out. Unfortunately, it didn't, it doesn't load real well on my slow computer here. Is there a way to get the uh, slide deck uh, downloaded so I can just get it downloaded and, and look at it in my PDF. Yeah, you go to that file that I sent you and yes. you can go to the you can go to the top and try to look for where it says file. Well actually it should be on the right side. Um okay. these some dots. There might be three dots. You click there and then it'll give you a download option. And okay. I'll, I'll have that open for you now. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, it's yeah, an interesting is... document. And, and I tried putting the actual documents I used for research um, specifically for people like you that could just sit down and, you know, it's, it's some pretty good stuff. Yeah, this is Tom. Uh, just a comment. My cousin and her husband live on Merritt Island. And a number of years ago, they started trying to grow mangoes there. Yeah, that's a that's a great area. There's history around that area. I I don't know the the history as much of the of the area north of me because I feel like people are are custodian of their area a little better. But they have some great microclimate there. Um, they're growing all sorts of stuff in that area. You know, we're very lucky in Florida because we get motivation from the north to the south. You know, we're we're pushing things that no one else in the country is doing, and we're even impressing ourselves. So, um, 
and then I'm completely jealous of all the stuff you guys get to eat. <laughs> like, you know, most of this stuff doesn't ship well either. Our rare stuff doesn't ship. Your good stuff will turn to mush. You know, we've got tons of great edible stuff that just doesn't do well in the mail. Yeah. Anybody else have comments, questions? Anything you want to bring up? Just one thing. As a librarian, I have access to a lot of online material through the library that might be harder to get if you're not affiliated with the so you know that would be fun for me if you have a question and you want to see what's available in the more academic literature i might be able to help you out with that yeah let's stay in touch and i'm always interested in you know we don't know what we're looking for we don't we don't try to look for it i know that sounds silly but you know now with the internet everything's out there so um yeah I but it's not all there. accessible <laughs> yeah well that's what i mean yeah uh, it's all out there we just don't know where it is because yeah now that now that everything's accessible somehow some way um you know we got to go through the gatekeepers and we got to find the the paper and then a lot of the stuff you if you don't do it on an instance, like Tom, if I'm not communicating with you when I find these things, uh, we might forget. It might be five years down the road and then you think of that <laughs> paper. So um, you could see a lot, a lot of that research was just, um, you know, a lot of cut and paste, but I try not to, when I find like a photo of Hayden and I'm with Salazar in the room and we look at each other and we say, had you ever seen a photo of Hayden before? And he tells me, no, like, you know, this is like a groundbreaking moment for us. You know, it's like, okay, let's, let's put this in the slides. Like not, not later now. And I'll tell you, I found that photo two weeks ago. We had no clue what the guy looked like. That's pretty Just cool. Just his wife. You saw the photo of his wife, very humble. That's, that's what we knew. <laughs> so it's interesting. You're delving a lot into the history of the mango. Um, I just listened to Dan Bussey yesterday at, at the American Heritage Apple Conference, and he's now going into the 16,000 cultivars that he has, varieties that he has written about in his published book, and he's now looking at the history of each and every one of them. He said he's through uh, A, B, and C, <laughs> and... <laughs> uh, it took him it took him a long time to get that far, but um, you know he's digging up all these fascinating stories and doing very much the same thing that Jorge is doing in terms of going back into nursery records and newspapers and and things that he can find and I think it's just really cool work. And hopefully Dan is going to share some of that with us. He um, kind of on the fly yesterday he he said I don't know what what prompted me to say this. He said but. Um, he had said to the to the conference that he hoped that he could convince Nafex to allow him to print an article in each Pomona about the history of, of a variety, like, you know, a couple times a year. So I messaged him back and said that would be fabulous. So because somebody asked if he was going to publish all this work, he said there's no way he could. I mean, the, the 16,000 varieties that he's written about is in seven volumes and when you start going into the history then you can imagine how many pages and volumes that would be so it's not feasible for him to publish that as a book but he's going to look for some inner an internet um, online options and and nafex is one of those so i thought that was pretty cool yeah, and we have it? a set of those of his volumes in the library here at msu yeah oh it's very nice <laughs> Yeah, amazing amount of work. I mean, he's retired now, and so this is what he's doing in his retirement, and he's just having a ball. So. My, my husband bought me a set of those books, and we donated them to our local library since our town, Ella J, is the quote-unquote apple capital of Georgia. So we decided to make them available. But I had no idea there was a, a Heritage Apple conference going on. I'm in all these fruit groups and didn't hear a word about it. What what? is that program so the um it's it's 
going on through the University of Idaho. They did their first one last year in person there at the University of Idaho. Um, and then they had planned to do a second in-person conference until COVID hit. So now they moved it online and it's free for everybody and it's recorded. Um, if you go back through the last Pomona um, and maybe even the one before that, I've listed all of the topics okay. and a link that you can access. But if you just Google University of Idaho or just Google Heritage Apple Conference, um, you should be able to hit it. Um, but they're all recorded. So I think they've got, they've done five. They're doing one a month. Um, yesterday's was the, uh, was the fifth talk and there's, there's going to be at least three more. So Great. Okay, that's great to know. I'm sorry, I was I looked at the Pomona and must have scanned and missed it. So thanks. Yeah, yep, it's in there. So um, and it, and if you can't, like I said, if you can't catch it live, then they've got it recorded. Okay, so. great. Any other thoughts, comments, questions? No. All right, guys, thank you for joining us this evening. We're gonna do this again, two more nights in January. I'm still looking for speakers. I got some people that I'm reaching out to, but if you're somebody that would like to um, speak, let me know. Um, a follow-up, Chris uh, has put in um, for Leslie or anybody else, if you look into the chat function, he's put the link in there to the University of Idaho um, conference on apples. Awesome, thank you. All righty, guys. Well, thank you. Welcome to our new board members and our new members in general. We have several of you who are relatively new joining us this evening. And if you guys have any questions, just send us an email. But thank you all. Um, thank you, Jorge, for the great talk. And thank you all for tuning in. And I hope you all have wonderful holidays despite the craziness of this year. And we'll see you all in January. Thank you. Right. Happy holidays. Happy, yep. holidays. Happy holidays to everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.